welcome everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit today about so good phage therapy, bacteriophage therapy. Um, it's a little bit unnerving giving this sort of talk when um, there's an incredible amount to learn and not a lot of expertise going around um, locally or even internationally on this. So I'll do my best, but let's see how we can get. I think it's an absolutely fascinating topic. All right. How were they first discovered? Um, every 48 hours, roughly, at just short of 48 hours, uh, it's regarded as a, one person described it as a bacterial holocaust occurring. So every 48 hours, basically within 48 hours, half of all bacteria die. And the number one reason for that, in fact, the reason that we're counting for between 40 and 50% uh, is these bacteriophages. This is an electron micrograph on the right. Um, that's what it looks like initially, and you can see why bacteriophage, as in bacteria eater, the name comes from. Look what happens on the right. We have a little bit later, a few minutes later, it looks like that. A few minutes after that, it starts looking like that. And then you end up with almost nothing, just the sort of dust from bacteria left behind. Um, and something had been eating them, so to speak. Nearly half of all the bacteria every 48 hours on the planet, especially in the ocean um, diet. The ocean in particular, it's actually a one of the big sources of carbon capture because those microorganisms for the bacteria basically sink to the floor of the ocean, taking their carbon with them. The first noticed by a guy called Ernest Hankin, who's a British bacteriologist, and he noticed just before the 1900s that the waters of the Ganges and, and the Yamuna rivers pres, uh, possessed the so-called antibacterial activity against Vibrio cholerae. So there was lots of cholera in the Ganges, um, but also if you got the water and you were able to filter out the bacteria, you managed, um, you, you uh, basically, so they used a porcelain filter to filter out the bacteria. What's left is some sort of substance which actually kills the cholera. So if you then gave that substance back to a culture of the cholera, the cholera died. He thought it may be a virus, but he wasn't sure. Um, it was certainly heat label. There's a couple of other people who can lay credit to the early st steps on the way, but really this guy, Felix Darrell, a uh, French-Canadian microbiologist is really the kind of father of this. And he did this famous experiment in, uh, in I think it was 1915 or 1917, where, again, he filtered the stools of patients who had Shigella this time, dysentery. So the filtering removed any bacteria. So he's just left with the fluid from this. And then he added that fluid to a broth culture of Shigella. So he cultured Shigella, took that what was left of the stools once they'd been filtered through to get rid of anything bacterial or bigger and added it back on. And it's just worth quoting because it's actually a remarkable passage in kind of science history, what he described in, a, in the book he wrote, this was in French, obviously been translated. He said, the next morning on opening the incubator, I experienced one of those rare moments of intense emotion which reward the research worker for all his pains. At the first glance, I saw that the broth culture, which the night before had been very turbid, was perfectly clear. All the bacteria had vanished and they had dissolved away like sugar in water. Wonderful example of what he what he had seen. As for the agar spread, it was devoid of all growth. And what caused my emotion was that in a flash I'd understood what caused my clear spots, in other words, where the cultures hadn't grown in a previous experiment, was in fact an invisible microbe, a filterable virus, but a virus parasitic on bacteria. So he's the first one really to put it all together. And he named it bacteriophage, really just bacterial eaters. Didn't exactly he correctly identify it as a virus, but obviously it took a long time for, for people to understand the depths of it. It's an interesting history after that, which I, I'm not going to go into beyond one or two more sentences, but really um, he ran into trouble. He clashed with a lot of his seniors um, about this new discovery. Um, and then they ran into some early manufacturing trouble. So they would send these phages around the world, but often when they got elsewhere to be tested, they degraded a lot. And we'll come back to that. Um, and it didn't appear nearly as effective as he was claiming. And then, of course, antibiotics hit off a few, uh, you know, in the early 40s, really. And that uh, became the paradigm of how to kill bacteria ever since. But it's lingered in the back. It, it um, kind of sustained the science in Soviet times in, in, in Poland and in other parts of the USSR um, and is now making a bit of a resurgence. So what are they? For those who don't know, most people will, but if you don't, they're just viruses that infect bacteria. That's a lovely impression of one on the right there. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, they are obligate intracellular parasites, obviously like viruses. So they depend for their replication on the cell that they invade, in this case, bacteria. And they are found absolutely everywhere. They're on land and water and sewage in your intestines right now, in the Arctic cores, in the Sahara Desert, everywhere you want to look. If there is life and there's bacterial life, there are bacterial phages. Um, and like we said, 
it, it, some of them actually one of the biggest preventers of, of uh, well, well, let's say carbon, carbon captures. Um, there are an absolutely enormous number of them. They're 10 to the power of 31 to 10 to the power of 32 phages in the world at any one time. That's almost impossible to visualize and to understand. So um, to help you out, I've got the next slide, which tells you what at least word puts it. And you can see now carefully by billion, tri, trillion, quad, quint, sext, sept. So you can see the Latin names for two, three, four, five, six, seven coming up. We get a septillion, which is one with, sorry, 10 to the power of 24. Here you're dealing with 10 to the power of 30, let's say 32, which if you follow the Latin a bit further, oct and non will give you a nonillion. So it's a hundred nonillions, which is that many zeros at the back of it. That makes it by far the most abundant form of life on earth. And it also means that the scale of the infections that are happening at any one time is mind blowing. There's a septillion, a trillion, trillion successful infections every second that take place on earth um, where these viruses infect new bacteria. And this is again why I said it, it causes the Holocaust every 48 hours roughly. Now, even that number, this 100 nonillion, which you can see over there, is very difficult to put in, in the scale. So it's about a tenth of the size of a bacterium to give you some idea. If you take them all that exist and you were lining them up in a line, you would get a line that stretched not just all the way outside the earth, but outside the solar system, outside to the nearest stars, it would keep going. You'd get outside the Milky Way galaxy, you'd get onto the local group, You'd get into the Pisces supercluster and where every dot on the screen there is now a galaxy, not a star. And you'd get, in fact, out to the Pisces set, Cetus supercluster complex, which is a billion light years long and 150 million light years wide. These things are so enormous that, like I said, if you pile them up in a line, you would get further than pretty much anyone even knows exists out here. There are a huge number of them. I will circle back to this point at the end because I think it's... It's actually got implications we, we haven't yet all thought through. So what do they look like the most? Well, there's a lot of them, but over 95% of them belong to this order called Corda virialis. Uh, Corda means tail, so the sort of tailed viruses. They have this icosahedral head at the top here, and then that contains the genome, usually in, the, in this case, the Corda virialis case, the double-stranded DNA, but you do get bacteriophages that have other forms of DNA and RNA. And then they have this tail, and the tail, in this case has legs, they don't all have these nice legs, but uh, when they do, uh, th that's one of the main attachment mechanisms, but they just, they float around, they actually float around by Brownian motion, they, they can't steer themselves at all, and they just kind of, so they randomly float, and when they hit the right receptor on a bacterium, then they latch on, and then inject their DNA um, somehow inside. Now, they come in lots of size and shapes, this is actually an artist, Ben Darby, who draws them, uh, for a living um, to give you some idea of the range then you can see they, they lots of different versions of this but ultimately all of this head and then this tail in some way the tail attaches to the bacterium and um, one of the subtypes of the cord actually injects itself by by sort of contracting the tail i've got a, a video of that here just for a couple of seconds but you get a sense of how it would work latches onto the bacterium and then squeezes itself like that and basically injects like a syringe the dna into the bacterial cell that's pretty cool. So watch it one more time. In it gets, hooray. And off it floats and to the next one. And then that DNA obviously gets inside the bacterium. Um, this is an electron micrograph, one of the few in the common, uh, public domain. But you can see again, you can get this idea of the tail. There's, in this case, some fairly dainty legs and this icosahedral head. And to give you a sense of the scale of them, this is a bacterial cell and then lined up along the wall here are all these bacteriophages. Um, all of which are effectively injecting their own DNA into the bacterium for the bacterium to replicate. When it gets in, um, there's two big ways, the things it does. Um, it's got a lytic or lysogenic lifestyle. So the lytic life cycle, uh, life cycle means that the PR is the bacteriophage in, in bread and it gets injects its DNA, fine. And then what happens is that generates more particles within the bacterium. So now you've got a whole bunch of uh, bacteriophages sitting, being made within the bacterium. When they get to a certain density, there's a trigger that occurs and then they rupture the bacterium. Bam, and out comes the rest of the um, bacteriophages and they go on to infect the next bacterium. That's lytic. You can kind of see where we're going, how that might be a good one to employ if you're trying to kill bacteria, because they do it anyway. 
You do get the lysogenic ones, the so-called temperate phages. And what they do is they inject their, their, uh, their DNA, or well, mostly DNA, into, into the bacterium, but then it integrates often into the chromosomes um, and doesn't lyse the cell, at least at that point. And then when the bacteria divide, obviously they copy that DNA. So the DNA still gets multiplied effectively, but really through bacterial replication. Um, and then occasionally when the right circumstances hit, such as when the nutrients are low or the pH changes or anything that's suggesting the bacterium is not long for this world, the phages then, this sort of trigger mechanism and it becomes like a lytic phase. So it effectively generates virus particles and ruptures the bacterium and spreads that way. And so the lysogenic ones actually introduce genes often into the bacterium or by definition and the lytic ones rupture the bacterium. But like I said, there's a, the, there's some overlap to these life cycles and there's, there's even chronic forms. It's not quite as clear as this division suggests, but give you some sense. And that's more or less all the virology you need to actually know, I, I think, to understand the next bits. This is an interesting field in that there's a lot of really good data that's starting to come after decades of really poor data from behind the iron curtain, getting some really good data coming from places like the US. Um, but what that's meant is that initially, because it's often used for um, uh, sort of on compassionate grounds with people who've got no other options, is that the case reports actually for this are more instructive than the larger trials, at least initially, because it highlights a lot of the key principles. So I'm going to go through some of them just to show you how this all works. So we've explained roughly what they are. I've given you some sense of just how many gazillions, well, non aliens there are. And we've shown roughly how it replicates. It gets into the bacterial cell, injects its own DNA, then it either lyses them or can insert its own genome. So let's go through some of the case reports. This is, I think, the best one of the lot because it's the most illustrative. This was published in 2017. Uh, and this gentleman, um, it's got uh, Robin's got Chips Gooley, who many of you may know from the HIV world. He's actually now co-director of the Center for Innovative uh, Phase Applications and Therapeutics at the University of California, San Diego. Um, so he's actually founded an institute really to look at these phages, which is really interesting. Uh, so this gentleman was a 68-year-old man. That is him, uh, who had a necrotizing pancreatitis with Abelmani infection, which was really unresponsive to the antibiotics. It was more or less pan-resistant Abelmani. And they had tried numerous antibiotic courses. Initially, it wasn't, uh, it was just MDR, then it became pan resistant. And they even tried draining the cyst percutaneously. But despite all of this, over four months in hospital, he deteriorated worse and worse. And he's eventually in a coma uh, in this picture. So, what they decided was that they would try to give him phages at this point because there really was nothing else they could give him. So, let's uh, try and understand the process. So, what they did is they, they screened 98 phages that were in the literature as being active against able money, at least as a group of them. Now, what they did next was really interesting. After about 20 hours, so they took this patient's able money and they screened them against each of the 98 phages. Here's what they found. So let me talk you through this diagram. The yellow is the, it didn't inhibit bacterial growth at all. So in other words, of these 98, the vast majority of them did nothing to the strain. It's a really important point I'm gonna come back to in the very next slide, because it's one of the key learning points for phages. And then some of them, you can see in progressively darker blue, got better and better. So after 20 hours, those, how many, six there in the dark sort of navy blue were able to inhibit bacterial growth for the entire 20 hours, whereas some of them only managed it for 12 hours, some of them managed it for six, and the vast majority managed them not at all. So this is a really key point. There's a huge amount of variation in the phages and the range that they can attack. So... Um, some of them actually can infect many genera of bacteria, some of them affect many species, but most of them affect just single strains or, or many strains within a species. So it's not even the tier the phages for able money, because that's what they had. You can see from this diagram when you blind them up, in fact, for this particular strain of able money, only that of the 98, which had previously shown activity, were actually only were, well, were active against this particular strain. It's a really important point because it wasn't known early on and it led to some of the failures in early phage therapy. So you can't assume any particular phage will work against any specific bacterial isolate. You have to test, basically, at least at, at where, where we are currently with the knowledge. Maybe in the future, it will be possible to predict on first principles, but at the moment, you can't know that. So there will never be these 10 phages work against your Staph aureus bacteria without checking. You can know that they work against some Staph aureus, but you won't know if it works against yours. And it's different for bacteria. They're much more narrow focused in the vast majority of cases, at least. So you either need to use phages, which you find, which are much wider in terms of their ranges, 
or which is much more commonly done, you give a cocktail of several phages, because then again, you are likely to achieve uh, success with at least some of them. So in this case, they chose, they did give a phage cocktail, but they knew each of these phages were at least partially active because they tested them. They gave it initially percutaneously via the catheters into the pseudocyst cavity. So they've got catheters trying to drain the abscess from this, around the, uh, the, the pancreas. So they injected it that way. And then they, after about two days, they gave it intravenously as well, after two weeks of you pardon. And you can see the names here has four phages in this one cocktail that they gave into cavitatory. And the second one here, there's another four from the Navy University, which just came through a bit later for them. And they made that into a different cocktail um, that they gave intravenously. There's a third one you can see there, which I'll tell you what happened. And that's the next slide. So what happened is they took a culture because they kept taking cultures, obviously. Eight days after they started phage therapy, one of the cultures, and they kept testing them against these phages, was shown to be resistant to the phage cocktail that they'd given, the one that they'd injected down the cavity. So this was quick. So how could you respond? And this gives you some sense of the time scale potentially. Within 72 hours, they had found another phage, which was now uh, active against the new culture. So in other words, and what they did is they discovered, because again, they can test this, this works really quickly. Remember how many new infections occurring every second around the world? This is a quick process, it's not a slow process. So within 72 hours, they'd taken their database, aimed it at the new phage and found, at the new, sorry, culture, and found at least another new phage. And they interestingly found that if they gave that new one with one of the older ones, it worked even better. So it was sort of synergistically. So they decided they'd give those two. Let's go back because I want to show this one. This is the last one here. See this Navy 71, which was in the old cocktail, and this new one here on the right, which is uh, the new one which uh, it, the new culture was susceptible to. So they gave them together. And what they discovered is that, yes, some of these able money had evolved to be resistant to the original bunch of phage, phages, but it came at a cost. They down-modulated the production of the polysaccharide, which is the big protector for able money, and lowered overall fitness. And interestingly, fascinatingly, also enhanced susceptibility to minocycline. Minocycline is in the tetracycline class, which was co-administered. So they could actually give now an antibiotic, which they couldn't before, because the strain which had evolved to be resistant to the first cocktail, had it came at a huge cost. And we are familiar with this. This is sort of... Um, antagonistic pleiotropy, if you like, from, from genetics, but it's really that when you evolve fitness in a particular landscape, that may be a decreased overall fitness. So in other words, in this case, the cost of being resistant to those original phages were less polysaccharide production, lower fitness, and susceptibility to an antibiotic, which they didn't have before. So phage resistance is the second big point to learn. It varies a lot, but it varies because, again, it's this trade-off specific to the bacterium and the context. So depending which other antibiotics you're giving at the time, depending on the pH, depending on which compartment, you're going to get various trade-offs. But that does happen. Interestingly, though, it can actually confer increased antibiotic susceptibility because of this trade-off mechanism. The cleverest example is one that I'm going to show you next. Uh, in fact, I'll maybe just come back to it and leave it over there. But it's, you can actually harness that potential. So what happened to this patient? Well, at baseline, he was comatose and renal failure. He was on a ventilator there. You can see tracheotomy and on vasopressors. Um, after a few days of phage therapy, he woke up, spoke to his family for the first time in weeks. He had quite a bumpy course um, overall because he's incredibly sick when he started, but he had a slow and steady improvement over many weeks. He got himself extubated, renal function improved, and he was discharged home and returned to work. That's him. He's in the public domain by name, so that's why he's named this, Tom Patterson and his wife. Um, he's holding a electron micrograph colored of able money, and she is holding the cure, the electron micrograph colored of one of the phages, which, which he got. So, well, I think that's an artist impression more like, but anyway, the, the important point is that there they are with the problem and the cure. Uh, I, looking at the way he's tucked his shirt in there, I suggest he probably hasn't gained all of his weight back, but uh, he's made a full recovery. He's now an advocate for this form of, uh, of therapy. So a nice story, but again, this is a case this case, well, this is one case. This is not going to convince people, but this is a lovely case because of how well they investigated and all the sort of things they were able to report. I've only scratched the surface here in my summary, but it's well worth looking at the paper if you're interested. Um, a second really sort of illustrative case report was about um, uh, MDR pseudomonas originosa case that people had. So this gentleman had an infected Dacron aortic uh, graft, basically. So the, the bottom part of the aorta had been replaced by graft because we had an aneurysm there, and it had failed to respond to multiple courses of antibiotics over three years. I hope you've eaten, because this is what it looks like. So they'd opened the skin up there. This was intraoperative specimen, but you can see, see here's the heart. 
Here's the Dacron graft. This is the top part of, or the bottom part of the aorta or the beginning of the aorta. Uh, and that it had become infected. And you can see here's the aorta here on the right. And this whole, the pus had tracked all the way through there, deep in through the bone, through a subcutaneous pocket of pus and out through the skin. So it basically had this open sinus that was draining Pseudomonas despite the best therapy they could give. Now here's the one I said I'd come back to. This is where they selected the phage so carefully. They chose the phage that binds to an efflux pump that Pseudomonas has. And that efflux pump was responsible because they knew that the test is basically that this efflux pump was singularly responsible for most of the resistance to keftazidine and ciprofloxin indeed that they had tried in the past in this particular case. If you think what they've done, they've given a phage that binds to the bacteria's chief defense weapon. So then the bacteria is in an awful situation because it's got one of two options. It can either suck it up and get killed by the phage or it can evolve, and I mean, if it can evolve, this, the population can evolve, and you could select four uh, variants which don't have that efflux pump, in which case that phage won't work, but then the antibiotic works. And so this was an ingenious idea, and they actually just gave one dose of this phage, uh, and it increased the susceptibility of the isolates twice, for twofold for keftazidine and tenfold for ciprofloxacin, and they were able to get back this use of these antibiotics, which they didn't before. Another really important thing, which is another learning point which you come to next, is that it's highly disruptive to biofilms, the phages. They're really good at killing things on biofilms, which is exactly where antibiotics are often the worst. And so they gave this literally as one dose. And after you got, you know, they continued the antibiotics, which they now had back because they could use them again. And after an additional month um, of antibiotics, they stopped all therapy and he's been cured. Uh, and this was, again, three years of, of antibiotics couldn't do. So one other learning point is that they're really good for biofilms. Antibiotics suck with biofilms. Those of you who don't know what a biofilm is, it's kind of a collection of uh, bacteria and a sort of extracellular matrix that they secrete together. It's the stuff that makes it so impossible to get rid of bacterial infections once they sit on plastic or prosthetics, metal or things like that. Um, and the bacteria, they're on a kind of planktonic state. They're not dividing well. And those are two big reasons why the antibiotics don't work. The bacteria, they don't divide well, and you often need dividing antibiotic, uh, bacteria for the antibiotics to work. And also, they sometimes just have a literal penetrance problem of getting underneath the extracellular matrix that's secreted. Um, whereas phages actually are past masters of killing bacteria, and they're quite used to this old trick. So what they have is enzymes on their capsids in many cases that actually degrade the biofilm and then allow them to reach the bacteria. And of course that amplifies itself because then they reach those bacteria, lies those bacteria, which releases more phages, which go on to the next level and down and down and down they go until the, back, until the biofilms are disrupted. So it's an incredibly useful thing because like I said, it complements antibiotics so well. And that combination of the disruption of the biofilms and the restored susceptibility to the antibiotics was enough to cure this gentleman actually after only one dose. And then on to the third really interesting case, which again shows another principle. In this case, they engineered the bacteriophages because they had a patient with a mycobacterium abscessus. Many of you, if you haven't treated mycobacterium abscessus, that's very good for you. And you're very lucky and you can pat yourself on the back. And if you ever see it, you should run. I, I work briefly in a, a transplant institute. And the, if you have a lung transplant, a person who's going for lung transplant, who has M. abscessus, most transplant units won't transplant you because the infection is regarded as basically ineradicable. You just cannot get rid of it, uh, at least an immunocompromised person. So it's just a disaster of an infection to have. This poor uh, uh, woman was a 15-year-old cystic fibrosis patient. She had disseminated mycobacterium abscessus. For some reason, this perhaps this very bold transplant unit decided that they would transplant her anyway. So she got a, a lung transplant on the one side. Um, and she developed a pneumonia, which was from mycobacterium abscessus, osteomyelitis in the sternum, multiple skin and soft tissue infections, um, all M. abscessus and deep infections as well. And they tried antibiotics and it failed. And that, like I said, if you've ever dealt with this horrible bug, you'll understand why. These are, that's the forearm, this is um, along the, the chest wall, but you can see those red kind of raised nodules are the skin infections there. So again, with nothing else to give them antibacterially, they decided they would give a cocktail of three phages. Um, but here's a bit interesting is that most of the bacteriophages for mycobacteria are actually the temperate ones. Remember those ones that are lysogenic, they don't rupture the bacterium. They, they insert themselves and they may cause other issues, but they don't rupture it, so they don't kill it. So what they did is they, from two of them that were these temperate or uh, ones causing the lysogenic form, they actually deleted the repressor genes. Those repressor genes there are genes that prevent it from becoming 
uh, lytic and rupturing the bacterium. So they deleted those genes and they therefore converted these ones from temperate to lytic. In other words, ones that could rupture the bacterium. And they give them intravenously 12 hour leave for 32 weeks, a long time. Yeah. And they actually, they tried a, tri a trial dose on this ones around near the sternum. And in fact, when they looked at them after, after a month, they in fact saw the rest of the skin lesions were a little bit better. But the one around the sternum where they'd done the trial dose topically was a lot better. So they thought, well, okay, let's add them topically to the other skin lesions as well. So they're there too. Patient made a full recovery, including impressively an improvement of lung function, full regaining of weight. Here's the pictures. So you can see before on the left, after on the right. Now there's obviously some scarring there, but those lesions are gone. They're flat now. This was a PET scan on the bottom there, which showed lymph nodes at the port hepatis, so that's the liver. But around there, there's big inflamed things, whereas after the treatment, basically nothing. And then the one that impressed me most, because I actually wouldn't necessarily have expected, look at the lung function. It was dreadful, dreadful, dreadful. She gets a transplant, it gets better, but nowhere close to normal. And then on phage therapy, this jumps up and stayed up and cured her. So she actually got about twice the benefit she would have got from just the lung transplant alone by clearing this infection out the lungs too. So the fourth big learning point is this, that you can actually bioengineer some of the phages. Um, you, you can have lytic phages uh, or what you need, obviously the ones that rupture the bacteria in general, but you can take temperate ones, the ones that don't rupture and engineer them to be lytic. Because remember, most of these do have the capacity to become lytic at some point, And you just need to effectively find a good and cunning way of doing it. I say that it sounds like it's easy, it's clearly not. But in, apparently with mycobacterial infections in particular, the phages tend not to be lytic. And so they need to be adapted a little bit. Okay, so that's, the kind of case reports as we've gone on through there. I think, like I said, they're actually more illustrative in some ways than the clinical trials, which are very scanty and in some ways um, less illum illuminating because they weren't able to do the incredibly incredible level of, of monitoring that these individual case reports did. But clearly, it, this is, case reports are not going to be enough to convince anyone to engage in this as therapy. So let's have a look at at least some of them. Um, I looked, uh, as of this morning, there's 31 clinical trials active or completed on excuse me, on clinicaltrials.gov, um, looking at phage therapies in various ways. Um, I'm just going to go through two of them. The, the, probably the most, or the, the most famous, I guess, of the clinical trials is, was a, a negative one. And that's this one. It was published in Lancet Infectious Diseases in 2019. And what they decided is they took a cocktail of bacteriophages that would treat pseudomonas, and they would apply it topically to burn patients who had pseudomonas uh, infection. So they burned denuded skin, pseudomonas infection, or randomized to either get a, these 12 phages applied topically or the standard of care, which for them was 1% sulfur diazine silver emulsion cream. So that was the kind of the two options. They planned 125. This trial was an absolute disaster in terms of, of, of sadness in the study pool that the sponsor pulled out halfway through. And you can read their pain between the lines as you read through this trial, but to their credit, they reported it all. And in fact, this trial has shown people uh, very important things to get right if, for future research. So what happened? Well, one thing is that they didn't check the phage. Phages worked against the particular patient pseudomonal strains. So they just took phages which worked against pseudomonas and gave it. Now we've already shown why, and I've you know, set you up by showing you the, the point, but it wasn't as well appreciated when the study was done in the early uh, 2010s, but that you really have to, you can't rely on them being active against pseudomonas. It's not a bacteria, it's not an antibiotic. You have to check that the particular bacteriophages are active against this particular patient pseudomonas. That's one big difference. And they didn't hear. And in fact, when they were able to do a postdoc analysis, it did suggest look, numbers are tiny because they stopped them after 27 patients, but they did suggest quite discrepant results. And the patients whose pseudomonal strains were susceptible to the phages didn't seem to benefit. But again, not statistically significant given that there were only 27 in total. And then a bigger problem, which highlighted another really important learning point, is that they discovered, and this is when the sponsor pulled out, that the phages which they thought they had, in fact, they'd been stored and, and in a way, because they produced them and sent them across the patients, they'd been stored in a way such they got a thousand to ten thousand fold reduction in active phages than the number they thought they had. And what had happened really was that they'd stored them in, in ways that we didn't understand at the time, but which phages can be quite particular about, and they'd lost a bunch of phages, well, the vast majority. So we're giving 0 0.001% you know, of, uh, sorry, 0 0.1, I guess, 0.01% of the phages they thought they were giving, which is just nowhere near. So another good learning point is that this can be tricky to get the phages in, in, in 
in to go. Now, again, this is well beyond my level of competency. I don't know much about how to manufacture phages, but reading up a lot about it, there, there seem to be parts of it which are very easy and parts of which are very hard. The easy part is getting numbers. Remember how many infections happen every second. So if you have a reasonable amount of bacteria to work with as hosts, effectively, and you just allow these things to replicate on their own, because remember, they auto amplify. You just give them enough raw material and they'll keep producing more and more and more and they amplify exponentially. So the typical preparation yields, uh, you know, what is this, uh, a, a trillion phages, enough for hundreds or even thousands of doses. So that's not the difficult part. Um, you have to make sure the preparation is sterile. You can't have any viable bacteria or anything left. That's not too difficult. Again, most labs could do that without too much trouble, but it's just something to watch. You clearly want to give an infusion it involves a few live bacteria. More interestingly, you may have to make sure that the level of various endotoxins are low. And the big one there is the gram negatives. You remember from immunology and or from, uh, from microbiology that gram negatives are this lipopolysaccharide. Uh, that's a huge stimulus for the immune system. The immune system goes mad whenever it sees it because it thinks it's under attack from gram negatives. Uh, and you, if you build, if you're using phages that are active against gram negatives, often you're using gram negatives to be the host. So you've got to make sure that that excess lipopolysaccharide is not part of the final preparation. That can be a bit tricky, but again, much less of a problem in gram positives, obviously. And then the hard part is the stability. Now, apparently, it varies a huge amount for various phages and different concentrations. So some phages are happy in a bottle at room temperature. Some have to be refrigerated much colder than that. Some have to, you know, you have to be very careful with things like pH and temperature. Interestingly, also the, the concentrations are different. Sometimes the higher concentrations actually of phages are much more stable than lower concentrations for reasons no one's entirely sure of yet. So that's one big thing to get right. This is what this latest trial didn't do. And then interestingly as well, you have to make sure the phages don't contain any genes known to be toxic. Because remember some of them, you know, obviously on certain genes into bacteria, you don't want to create a monster uh, while you're there. So that's kind of some of the manufacturing issues. Like I said, it's easy to make them, hard to make sure, harder to make sure that you sterilize them and make sure the endotoxin is low enough. And the tricky part apparently is the stability of them, which again varies. So some bugs are easy to treat with phages, some are not, and the phages vary a lot. Um, a different trial, again, now this is, you can see how this is in the early days of this sort of thing. This is the NF13, and you get into nature microbi uh, microbiology, single arm trial. So anyone who wants to do research, now's your chance. Um, this was looking at Staph aureus bacteremia, and you had to be, quote, seriously ill as the discretion of the doctors. And they gave one bacteriophage, a single type, um, that was administered twice daily for 14 days in addition to the standard of care. Now, single arm, so they weren't trying to show efficacy here, clearly. What they were trying to do is see that even in these sick patients, if you're giving someone intravenously, um, what sort of adverse events do you get with this? Do you get uh, injection, infusion site reactions? Do you get systemic reactions? Do you get any organ, you know, organ dysfunction, renal failures, etc.? Um, and the answer here is, is interesting, but well established across many, many trials. And it's one of the most interesting things about this. They found no adverse reactions. And also in this case, no resistance for what it's worth, although they were only looking at 14 days. Uh, for what it's worth, the efficacy all but one survived to 90 days, which looks good. But again, there's no comparison here to make any sense of. But that's another learning point, and the last of them really, is that phage therapy is incredibly safe. Now, it's very nervous to say that, because you can only be wrong as time goes on. You, you know, no one will give you credit for being right. But I, I'm sure we will discover some additional quirks to this, but at least as far as anyone can tell at the moment, it's incredibly safe. Why? The big reason is because it only targets bacterial cells. It does not, they do not enter human cells. They cannot enter human cells. There are phages in you right now already. This is not causing you any harm. Uh, the body can deal with phages as well, which get to where they don't want, to, want them to be. But really the target is bacterial cells only. So it's very safe based on the clinical data to date. Obviously, please be aware that this is early days. Maybe we'll figure some other things out. Um, one thing which is more theoretical than others is the orally administered phages because they interact with the gut epithelium quite a lot. And there's potential, at least in mouse models, to get leaky guts or uh, also actually the immune response to the phages. Um, so there's, but this has not been shown to be clinically relevant in humans, but again, lack of evidence rather than evidence of, uh, of absence. And, um, and again, but most impressively, when it's given syst uh, systemically, like intravenously, there's absolutely no evidence of any injection site reactions, any systemic reactions. They don't get febrile or pyrexial. They don't start going to renal failure. These are incredibly safe um, therapies, at least as far as we know so far. But again, the early signs are very encouraging. And this is one big advantage about research, which I think will burgeon you know, from here in the next decade or so is that it's easy to add to standard of care therapy. So I think it's very bold to, to do this randomized trial for severe infection against antibiotics at this point. I don't think we know enough. But to add to standard of care is easy because the, the downsides appear 
little to none, um, at least for the patients. And obviously there's costs and other things. A couple of other thoughts, which I just thought I'd, I'd kind of round off with and then we'll open it up for, for discussion. Um, one is it's still not clear apparently, and again, I, I'm not an expert in the field, but the experts say that it's not clear exactly what the body's immune reactions do to these phages. Um, this is the first, this is the graph on the left there of that first, remember the guy with the able money who had the pancreatic system and got phages, the first phages given in America to a patient. Um, and this is what happened. This is phages basically the concentration over minutes. And you can see by about an hour, they were gone. So giving intravenously, but within an hour, they're almost gone. Certainly by two hours is nothing and three hours is nothing to find at all. Um, or four hours rather. And what happened is that they actually were able to compare because this trial did an incredible amount of kind of basic science research. And again, I've only just scratched the surface of it. Um, but they're able to compare a rate when they gave it in the patient's plasma versus when they gave it in saline. And the patient's plasma seemed to decrease the level a lot quicker, which supported the idea that there's something in the plasma which neutralizes those phages. Um, and there certainly have been, uh, there's more and more evidence of antibodies able to neutralize phages. So if they do get into the bloodstream, they can disappear quickly there. So then the question comes to how do you get around that? Because you want the phages, at least for the severe infections, do you give if you've got a cocktail, do you maybe give one for one day, the next, the next day, et cetera, like that, so that you don't give the antibiotic, the immune system as good a look at the at all of them at once. Um, also important is that we need to understand the cross-reactivity because it would be really good one day to say, okay, if you have antibodies to that phage, then you also can't use these following five. But we don't have that at the moment. Now you've just got to test them and, f and figure out. And then a couple of, like I said, a couple of sort of ending points to look. It's helpful to compare again here, this phages versus antibiotics. I actually don't think that's the right framing. I think it's phages and antibiotics for the at least the initial stages of this. But if you have a look at this, the safety can be problematic in antibiotics. We know, I mean, they're pretty safe drugs, but they do cause a lot of side effects at times. So it can be really problematic. Phages definitely win on that count. There's no evidence really of any clinically significant adverse events with the, with the phages in humans. Um, Specificity is much broader with antibiotics. So if I give uh, amoxicillin clavulanate, or so-called augmentin, I know I'm going to kill pretty much all of those E. coli from the community and uh, a whole bunch of other genera I can't even say, and most of the gram negatives if I can think of, and half the gram positives. There's basically no phages that do that. So they're much narrower on general. There are a couple, but in general, they're much narrower. So to the degree where it's not even for that species, it's actually just these strains of that species in many cases. That actually, so that's a downside and a plus side. So it's clearly downside in that, that you can't just have the megaphage that's going to work for all infections, but it's very helpful for collateral damage. So for example, it's not going to nuke your gut flora and give you all the, res generate antibiotic resistance like the antibiotics would um, by the collateral damage off target to the gut. And, that's, and the biofilm penetration, like I said, in antibiotics is, is often poor. There are a few which are better than others, but it's generally poor, whereas phage is often excellent because they're actually very good at this. They try and get to the bacterium in those biofilms. They evolve to do it. Um, the dosing antibiotics clearly need repeated dosing. Phage is actually not clear. Now, when people have given these, like you said, it, the range has been anything from one dose to months of therapy. Um, but the principle, at least with phages, is that they auto amplify. So if you give, I'm going to choose a ridiculously low number. If you give 100 phages, you wouldn't. You'd give a billion, a trillion. But if you give 100, how many phages do you have tomorrow? Well, they're going to get into whatever bacteria are there to the extent the bacteria are around. And in the bacteria, they divide, or they, sorry, they replicate, and then you get an exponential increase. So they increase in kind of concert to the number of bacteria that are there. So in some ways, they, they, get to, they make the right number to kill the bacteria. Um, based on whatever how many bacteria they are. And that's not to say you only can get away with one dose, of course. There may well be reasons to dose many, many times, given things like immune clearance and other things. Um, time to develop new ones is a really important thing where it's different. Antibiotics, the pipeline is a decade or more to get an antibiotic from conception to, to uh, production, let alone safety. Um, phages, though, you can find or evolve new ones within days or weeks. So in this one case, remember, we said they actually found a new one within 72 hours, but you could evolve it within about the same time frame. So you don't even need to have all the phages. You just allow them to grow against whatever new strain it is. And whichever ones seem to kill are the ones you select out. And you repeat that a few times. And you can actually develop these things within days to weeks. Um, again, in an ideal setting, obviously, that's going to not not true of every case. I put patentable here slightly because I do think it's important to understand the financial incentives a little bit. Now, antibiotics are easy to patent. It's your antibiotic and you can get it through the patent pool. Phages are hard because they're out in the environment. Evolution is doing the hard work of R&D for you. So it's much harder. It's very hard in many jurisdictions to patent a phage at all because it was found in the environment, not created. 
Um, even those you find, you could evolve uh, other ones to do similar job in the lab, and it's not clear that that would um, you know, interfere with patenting. And or you just find a whole bunch more. There's only, I think, something like 14,000 phages which have been put on the biobanks to date. Uh, you've seen the number. I gave you the number, and it gets you out, out past the observable universe almost. And there are so many that are here that are around that it's, again, it's unlikely that this is going to be the same financial model. And I do think it's important just to at least plant that seed to understand um, some of the kind of the problems with, with going, going forward in this thing. It, it's difficult to understand. I, they, there may be patentable parts to the process, but the exact phage is going to be tricky. Again, if you edit it, you maybe you patent that, but it's not clear that you would get around when there's all those trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions. Um, that they won't be able to find something next week which does the same job a little bit easier. Um, where do phages uh, get placed at the moment? Well, I mean, we're in the absolute infancy of clinical trial work. So it really, you know, this is almost a call to anyone on the call who's going to do this. Um, we need many, many, many more clinical trials to get this idea and flesh out these unanticipated quirks, like that first RCT I showed you from the Lancet, um, where they'd, they'd made two kind of now well understood mistakes. Um, which led to the failure of the trial, but which able, enabled um, subsequent people to learn um, learn about them. So we need a lot more of this, and we're going to find a whole bunch more complexities that we didn't know about before as the trials go on. I think that's without doubt. Um, like I said, I think the place now is in twofold. You've either got compassionate use when antibiotics have just proven not to be useful, and I think, again, that's what you're seeing being snapped up across the richer part of the world at the moment, um, you know, use uh, times to use that. The other way I think of doing these trials is in addition to standard of care, like I said, not an alternative, to, but an addition. And then if you establish it as a good addition, then you could start looking as an alternative eventually down the road. But I don't think, at least for many cases, that's, that's hugely viable, at least for serious infections. You might be able to do it for skin and soft tissue infections or, or minor ones where the cost of, of, of the phage therapy maybe not working is not uh, lethal. So I think you could do it that way for non-severe, but for severe, probably addition to um, one thing I was thinking about yesterday was, you know, could you use it instead of antibiotics in the agricultural sphere? I mean, the large part of the resistance in the world is generated by antibiotics given incredibly broadly to, um, you know, cows and sheep and, and livestock and other things to try and keep them healthy. Um, you would think you'd be able to do trials easier on livestock than humans. Uh, and that would be a good place, I think, maybe to start and to have a look. I think that's a, not a bad place because the advantages are huge. Um, is interestingly, some people have decided to instead of using phages, they're going to try and see what the phages make to break down the bacteria, the lytic proteins, and try and synthesize those and just give those proteins alongside antibiotics rather than the phage itself. I actually have, I think on evolution grounds, that's more likely to fail. I think there's narrower constraints. They're more easy to evolve resistance to. But it's a really interesting idea, and we'll see where people go with it. Um, and like I said, I think combination therapy is the is the big thing to hold in prov uh, pr promise because you really get this uh, direct efficacy from the phages, but also it interestingly interplays with the antibiotics themselves. Um, so I'm gonna put up a couple of summary points and I'm just gonna end with one other slide of sort of evolution considerations on this. We know from this talk, hopefully, bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. And no surprise, if you've walked in late, I'm sorry, uh, phage range can be quite small and that's a really key um, issue to look at. Phage resistance is often reported, but you can overcome that relatively quickly also. It's not like you need to design an entire antibiotic. You can usually overcome it with the phage bank you've got in front of you. If not, you can evolve one pretty quickly. Um, phages can be particularly useful in attacking biofilms. And again, that's where the sort of synergy with the antibiotic seems to be useful. Um, manufacturing can be tricky. They need to be sterile, endotoxin free, and there's issues with stability. Again, nothing that current technology can't get over. It's just that you have to pay attention to it. That's really the issue. Phage therapy seems to be very safe, at least currently, and very good theoretical reasons to assume it will remain safe, although you may find one or two rare things as we do more trials. But the big thing here really is the extent of the clinical efficacy really remains to be proven. We know we're close to what we need to do to sort of roll these out as the big time. This is an exciting time to look at other options given the antibiotic pipeline and this uh, really, I think, yeah, not being on the right trajectory here. I've also taught you what a nonillion is, which is really handy. Now you'll know for the rest of your life, as well as how to uh, think, do things with sextillions and septillions and other kinky sounding things. Um, and then I just wanted to end off with this slide, basically saying, well, from an evolutionary perspective, I think it's helpful here to zoom out a little bit and look at this. Phages and bacteria have been fighting each other for a billion, a billion years, probably several billion years. 
And clearly neither is the victor. So what you can kind of get from that is that this is not going to ever be a magic bullet to end all bacterial infections. There's always going to be an interplay and a kind of arms race between the two. We actually don't know where phages came from. There's two big possibilities that they could have evolved from, well, actually be a remnant of the sort of pre-cell uh, uh, biology. In other words, the sort of origin of life, which is thought by most people to be sort of RNA or DNA, uh, but probably RNA being these sort of hangovers from there, or they could have uh, been bits of the genome which broke off from bacteria and um, are now trying to live their life in a selfish Dawkins way, uh, as in the selfish genes way. We don't really know, um, but we do know that they have one huge advantage over our antibiotic pipeline. And that's our antibiotic pipeline depends on ingenuity, maybe AI uh, coming up soon, but then there's a long trial and error process to see what happens. Phages though, are evolutionary organisms, they evolve. There's a trillion, trillion infections happening every second. There's absolutely everything you'd want to, for rapid evolution to occur. And you get the entire phage stock replenished basically in the world about every 48 hours. Evolution is an incredible thing. In evolutionary circles, there's something that's known as the orgal second rule, which is evolution is cleverer than you are, which is designed to put young researchers in their place when they think, ah, oh, how could evolution have done this? Evolution is cleverer than you are. In bacteria, I mean, just to give you some idea of the range, there's bacteria that can survive radiation 1,500 times greater than it would take to kill a human. There's bacteria that uh, act as uh, nidus is basically for ice crystal, so they can generate frost on a, on a plant to kill it and help it eat. There's bacteria that don't even take in biomolecules that send out these long things which take strip electrons off other living things and other non-living things and can make entire circuits. This is what evolution can generate for bacteria. It's doing the same genius things for phages. And this offers, I think for me, not now, because we're far off there, but I think in the long run, if I were to bet, and I'll stick my neck out here, if I were to bet and said, is the future of getting rid of bacterial infections in humans more antibiotic or more phages, in other words, like which, which would be the predominant way? And there may never be one or the other. It may always be a bit of both. But which would you think is going to be the long-term dominant way of getting rid of that? I would put phage therapy above that, above antibiotics. And the reason is, We've got evolution on our on our side with phages, and we have evolution against us with antibiotics. And I think that is not well enough appreciated from an evolutionary perspective. And I think it's one reason why this is, I think, headed the right direction. We'll see. Maybe in five years' time, I'll be back with a sheepish look on my face. But I think that's where it is. I'm going to leave it there, and I'm very happy to take questions. I'm just going to leave it on this last page. Uh, for those who are interested, because I know some people did ask actually before this, those are two really nice review articles. The top one, in fact, in particular is outstanding. It's got uh, Chip Shuley there as the senior author who, who was the guy, I remember, who started his phage institute in San Diego and also wrote that, uh, was written a lot of papers on phages, but also including um, acetobacter for mining. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm very happy to take questions for the remaining time. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I'm just looking through the chat. So thanks, Lauren. You've put the CPD points up. Maybe just put it again in case anyone joined late, but that's that's great. So please do enter that. Um, hey, yes. So Nasli is asking about controversy about phages with contribution to the spread of anti antimicrobial resistance genes. Yeah, so that's a big thing. I, I left it out just because it gets enormous um, at this point, but it's a really important point, especially with the lysogenic ones, the temperate ones, the ones that are integrating genes into the bacterial genome in many cases. Um, they obviously bring some resistance genes, so they cause a lot of resistance. I mean, uh, and cause a lot of pathogenesis. Uh, so, uh, well, pathogenicity. So, I mean, you take Vibrio cholerae as a species that sits there happily doing nothing until it gets infected by two bacteriophages, which give it the production of the, you know, the pilus and then the, the particular toxin, and then it transforms into this monster. So that's clearly a concern if you just random, you know, phages clearly are, are and, the, and the same thing with antibiotic resistance genes, phages are often part of that. So that's that's not, with, it's absolutely true. Um, what you need to be careful of, obviously, with these phage therapies, just making sure that the phages you use don't do any of that. So you strip them of genes if you need to, and you make sure they don't, you know, generate or, or bring across resistance with it. So it's something, it's more important for the lysogenic ones, which are the ones which don't rupture the bacteria. Um, but even for the lytic ones, which just rupture them quickly, um, it is a still a concern. So that's definitely one of the ones I put up there in the manufacturing process to check out for. Um, and then uh, any comments on the rate of progress of phage research cost involved funding makers? Yeah. So look, it's come, it's off, off a standing start, basically. It's like I said, antibiotics in the West, at least, have dominated this stage for you know, nearly 100 years. 
um, or eight years at least, this is, uh, it's, it's coming. So what, what you see is an exponential increase in the research into this funding is starting to shift down there because again, this is, people are worried about the antibiotic pipeline, but it's coming off a very low base. So the rate of improvement is, is really exponential in terms of the amount of research. Like I said, five years ago, I think there were one, there was one clinical trial now, there's 31 currently active ones on clinicaltrials.gov, but it's coming off a slow base. So it's not, um, it's not dominating the research sphere at the moment. Um, and I'm just looking through, are they expensive? Uh, someone's written on a, a message to me. Um, so yes, but not intrinsically, if that makes sense. In other words, if you look at what, you know, say this was a, a common way of treating infections. No, there, there wouldn't be huge expensive um, to get right. Most research labs could do them in-house. It's not like you require special things. Obviously there's biosafety, et cetera, that come with that, but uh, you could centralize that and send it out as a, you know, as a, a relatively safe, um, thing to do, not intrinsically expensive, but clearly expensive at this point. I mean, if you wanted to get this off the ground, it would be a lot. Um, and do you isolate them from the actual organisms that's cultured on the patient? I'm not sure what that means. Do they essentially isolate them from the actual organism that's cultured on the patient? So not sure, but you'd obviously you'd give this to the patient to uh, intravenously or other, and they would find the bacterial organism themselves through kind of random drift, like I said, as we go. Um, then Lyle's asking, what, what do you think phage therapy play the most important role? Um, very, I mean, hard to say, right? I mean, I, I think that we have a huge epidemic of MDR uh, problems. You know, we, we're some of the worst in the world in terms of uh, resistance rates in private sector and public sector to some degree too. Well, to really both sectors, it's terrific. So I think if that becomes a thing in the world that they're using for multi-drug resistant organisms, we'll certainly have a place for it here. Obviously, we have the potential here to do it in mycobacterial infections and sort of resistant TB infections in places, again, where the bacterial side of the antibiotic side of things is not working out enough. I think that's an interesting thing because I think we have a lot of it here. Remember, of course, and I know it's obvious, but remember, of course, this only applies to bacteria. You can't, there's no um, virophage, or, you know, no viruses that take the same viruses in the same way. Anyway, um, and then uh, Seski is saying, we're planning a trial with phages for TB in Cape Town. Yep, agreed. So that would be a good place to be exciting. There are lots of challenges, especially when it comes to funding. Thank you. That's great. Good to know that we're doing some trials with TB in this country. I think that's fantastic. And then uh, Seski was asking, how do phages fare against TB? Well, we don't know. Um, so there's there's been case reports of phages in, micro, in, um, in non-tuberculous mycobacteria, which is the dominant sort of mycobacterial forms in the US. I don't know. Let me see if I can get Saskia to be able to unmute. Hold on, if you want to say, because you may know more, Saskia, about the state of research in TB. Let's just say, how do we do this? Make you co-host. Okay, if you want to, Saskia, you're welcome to unmute and, and let us know what you what you think. Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, I am uh, I could talk for an hour about uh, phages for TB, <laughs> but um, I won't do that. The great benefit uh, from that is actually the low, relatively low diversity of TB that enables where for most other infections, you really need like individualized uh, treatment for each patient. For TB, there is actually a phage cocktail that has been developed by the Hetful uh, group who has all the uh, mycobacterial phages in the world. Uh, and they developed this cocktail of five phages, which is active against most most subtypes of TB actually. So in this case, you could actually actually do a good clinical trial with phages, whereas mostly it's only compassionate use basis, but we are planning to use it in, in patients with drug sensitive TB to actually really have a good clinical trial where you can really see an outcome and whether it works or not. Fantastic, I'm glad, I'm but, really um, I'm delighted to hear that. Yeah. We are uh, requesting for funds. We've done many applications so far, um, and hopefully one will be successful soon. Well, fantastic. That's really, really good. I wish you well on that, because I think it's very, very, very exciting and you know, good that we include including TB in that as well. So that's, that's fantastic. Let us know. I'll <laughs> reach out to that. I will. <laughs> if there's any funders, if there any funders on the call, fund Saskia. Oh, yes, um, please. <laughs> DM I don't think we have many funders on these, but, but yeah. Um, great. I think that's it. I think just looking at the time, it's pretty much there. So we're gonna. I think we can end there.